All right, we are back. And after a loaded Champ U barbecue weekend, we got to talk final class predictions and where potentially this class could end up because I think Oklahoma could have a sneaky good top five class. I think probably number five is as high as you get. But we're going to take a look at it. We're going to do the favorite thing that you guys love to do, jump into the class calculator. Before I do that, though, I'm joined by Cooper from over at Unfair Sports. Coop, how are you doing today? Doing good. Love watching uh, Tennessee put it to the uh, the Prancing Ponies or the Aggies or whatever they're called. And um, so, yeah, looking looking like A&M may continue that drought. And so uh, that's, a, that's something to celebrate about. But this class, we'll look at that transition. But this class... I think is going to be something to celebrate about too. Oh, it a hundred percent is. And, uh, man, we were, uh, taking victory laps after the champion barbecue. Uh, now to preface this, I think we thought this class could be a little bit better than it was because we were talking about Max Granville being in the class. And, um, you guys will be watching this on Tuesday morning and Max Granville is committed to Penn state. So that's a loss for Oklahoma, but this is where I think we're going to kick it off with the class calculation and, where we think this is going to end up. So CJ Nixon, I don't think that's a surprise or what anybody's thinking. He's going to go somewhere else. I think he ends up in the class for Oklahoma. The question is, does he play defensive end or tight end? Uh, that has kind of been floated around a lot of other places, but since Oklahoma is not taking Max Granville, I think Nixon will probably play defensive end for you, but he's elite at either position. The other defensive end that I look at for Oklahoma is Smith or Rogbo. And this is a guy, if you guys remember, in my champion barbecue preview, I told you I didn't think there was a leader there. And a lot of people were telling you Texas Tech and Texas. Um, and one of the things that I learned when I talked to Smith or Rogbo is Norman feels like home to him. And that's something that when you hear a kid say a place feels like home, that's a pretty good indication that that school has a very good shot at being in – the mix for that player. So Coop, what's your thoughts on the defensive end room and how do you think Miguel Chavis continues to wrap this up? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly with, uh, with Nixon because I mean, we, we've talked about guys coming in with positionless football, uh, kind of like when you talk about basketball, um, you know, with, with Nixon, he is a, he's a guy that if you want to try to give him his run at tight end, um, I don't, I don't think anybody's going to argue with you about that. Uh, if you let him take his run um, as a defensive end, same thing. But um, I think that you're looking at him as a, again, it's not a, it's not going to be a monumental surprise to anybody, but again, you, you keep the Oklahoma guys in state. Um, it, it's just hard to be a national title title contender. If you can't, you know, put a border up around your state and, and just keep those guys from exiting. Um, but also, uh, you know, Pet Jack. Uh, Pet Jack is, a, is another one that I fully expect uh, Oklahoma to land. And um, you have, uh, you have Chavis stacking, you know, that's three classes in a row to where you've got uh, guys from PJ Adebaware and uh, Daniel Koye, Nigel Smith. Um, you know, uh, Wyatt Gilmore, and then you bring in Pet Jack. Uh, that's, I mean, it's not anything to, it's not anything that, to shake your head at, you know, because there's, there's, there's going to be guys who will need some time with Schmitty, need some time in the weight room and need some time to really just full on out, uh, learn the position. So um, I still think that we have the chance with uh, Nixon and Pet Jack uh, again, just Nixon, where, wherever he is going to play, that's uh, going to be still yet to be determined, but um, I, I do expect both of those guys to be added to the class. Yeah, and Kate Petchak, uh, I forgot to mention him. I, I, I'm always forgetting about him. It, it feels like he's committed already uh, because there was so much hype around that, and I keep forgetting he's taking the other visits, and then we're going to get an announcement here uh, sometime soon in the next couple weeks. But no, uh, Kate Petchak, uh, that's a guy, I can't remember if it was Colin or Josh, but I was asking about, you know, hey, he's listed as a defensive lineman, but he's like 260, 270. So he's not big enough to be an interior guy, but I also feel like he's a little too heavy to be an edge guy. And I was like, where does he fit? And he got a lot of comps at that point to Ethan Downs, uh, which I forget. Ethan Downs is a guy that, depending on if you're running a four, you could slide Ethan in there. Uh, but he also is a really good edge rusher. So having Cade Petchak to be able to fill into that role a little bit, which, guys, I'm telling you, uh, the kid's actually pretty big. 
Yeah. I think Kate Petchak's going to be a pretty good player. Uh, definitely an underrated guy. If you see Oklahoma and some of the other elite schools across the country trekking up to North Dakota to recruit a kid, uh, he must be pretty yeah. good. Definitely so. And I don't want to forget, out, uh, forget about Alexander Shieldknight, too, because he is another edge guy um, already in the class, but um, he's another one out there. So you've got a couple different body types. You've got guys... Uh, you know, Shield Knight, a little bit on the leaner side, 220, 225 currently. But um, from what I've heard from some of the parents, so some of the uh, the offensive, the defensive linemen, and uh, some of the uh, summer workout numbers, you know, getting getting the weight and getting the getting the weight up and getting in the weight room, um, you know, whatever we want to do, whether it is uh, Bates and uh, Chavis you know, kind of doing a tag team with a guy like Pet Jack. Um, it, Ethan Downs really shouldn't have had to play uh, as early as he did. But when he came in with the motor and the willingness and the attitude that he had, it's just hard to keep a guy like that off the field, especially if you, you know, just lost several guys to the NFL when you lose, uh, when you lost guys like Nick Benito and Isaiah Thomas and that whole crop. So uh, I'm excited about this because, again, with the guys that you already have on, you don't really require any of these uh, kids to come in and be day one contributors in the SEC, but start working towards uh, a specialty and being able to be quality, uh, quality on the depth side. Ethan Downs, one of the few good Lincoln Riley, Alex Grinch evaluations. One of the few. And, that one uh, is, isn't that weird? Three of Oklahoma's best defensive players are from the Lincoln Riley, Alex Grinch era, Billy Bowman, Danny Stutzman, Ethan Downs. It's crazy. Yes. To think about. yes. And, uh, and again, I don't believe that. Um, I don't believe that those guys gave into, um, those bad habits. And I think that with the new defensive minded staff coming in, um, you know, they obviously had the opportunity to excel and to relearn. And so that's, uh, you know, one of the things we talk about with these classes coming in now is there is not, uh, you know, a, just a, a mountain of bad habits that you have to uh, get out of these kids, uh, you know, heads and out of the, you know, cause it's muscle memory at that point, they practice over and over and over and over. And so now you you saw Stutzman Bowman and Ethan Downs take these giant leaps last year. And so that's why it's exciting to have those guys coming back this year, but um, bring in another crop of D ends and D lines along with Kamori Moore. This you can't, you can't help but smile. Yes. Now I want to turn our attentions to the offensive line here, because this is the one that, I think everybody's really probably tuning it in for. And I think this is probably the most intriguing part of the class predictions at this point. I've been a long time believer in Fasusi, a very long time believer. And I know Oklahoma made a lot of ground with Babalola. I also have a hard time believing Oklahoma is going to beat Stanford in the academic portion of this. And I'm not sure how well Bill Beatonbill sold the idea of NFL draft development and going to the NFL to Andrew Babalola. So the visit went really well from all other indications. This is a kid that doesn't talk a whole lot. So I'm going to stick with the Fasusi prediction as your five-star for this class. Now, Afalava at one point I was pretty high on, and I think Oklahoma could still land Afalava. But I'm going to shift attention to Lamont Rogers. And the reason why is you know this staff has to have felt burned by Caden Green. And <laughs> I hate to say it, with the way that they restructured the NIL, you can't imagine Brent Venables is going to use that as a weapon. And I can't imagine a world where he has an opportunity to take Lamont Rogers from Drinkowitz, and he doesn't do it. So I'm going to say Lamont Rogers, and if you land both of those guys or even just one of them, I think you can also land Sean Hutton, who is out of Louisville High School, who I think is actually a sneaky good key to the recruitment of Michael Fasusi. Uh, good friends out there. He plays center, though. So if you might ask yourself, well, why does he have a PWL offer? Why not a scholarship offer? Um, Oklahoma has already filled up their position of center with Owen Hollenbeck, and so you don't really want to take another one at a scholarship level. So Hutton's kind of sitting in the mix with the PWO from Oklahoma and Texas. And I feel like if either one of those schools offer Hutton a scholarship, it's probably a done deal for them to get Fasusi as well. So Coop, what's your thoughts on the offensive line? 
because uh, I mean, shoot, Ty Haywood still got us in his top three as well. Yeah, and I think that we rounded out. You know, I am a massive, 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 massive believer that uh, Ryan Foje is going to be a five star that uh, just continues to rise, like we saw with. Uh, you know, Adebowari uh, two years ago. Um, this is a guy who his film looks, I mean, he looks like Tyler Guyton from last year. And he has that athletic ability, the footwork. Um, he's got a lot of strength to him. So, you know, if, if Oklahoma doesn't land, you know, five, five-star offensive linemen, like, you know, about a year ago, people were kind of projecting, it's not that big a deal. But we were recording this the day that one Oklahoma NIL collective it, it has been brought inside and they're, they're bringing it more local. It's ran by a businessman. It's, it, he is one of the first people to, um, you know, to, to start an NIL company. And so I, I don't think that there's any coincidence that you saw a guy, uh, you know, we, we were joking about it a little bit. It's uh, the Dominic Williams is highlighted in, in the video, you know, for the collective announcement. So I got to feel that like if, if, if Hutton is, a guy that needs a scholarship, we were, I think we're going to get him a scholarship. Uh, if he's a guy who just gets a, you know, a pretty nifty uh, NIL deal, if that, you know, I just don't know if the, I got a scholarship mantle really means a lot because I see him as like a, as an Eric Swenson, you know, as a, uh, we, we had um, uh, McKay Mattire here this past year to where it's just guys that just come in and they've got a good work, work ethic. They've got a great attitude. And so I, I agree with you. I think, I think that we do land Rogers, Fasusi, Hutton, and I, I'm, I'm going to throw in off a lava too. Um, this is a guy that I think that he is, he is strong. He is very, very, very strong. I think that he has um, – it, it's probably going to be down between us and Utah at this point. But if you can take those four guys matched up with uh, Hollenbeck and Foje, that's 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 six offensive linemen right there that is what, it's what we need. And I, and, I, and I don't think that it is a full-on need from the aspect that we have nobody on campus. I think it's because we took – a couple of years to where we had two offensive linemen or Lincoln Riley brought in a couple guys and they didn't stick uh, because, you know, when we, when we lose Savion bird from last year and we lose a couple of other guys from last, from the past couple of years, it, that's just put us in a, in, in a hard spot. And I don't know if you can, can you know, keep on going back to the, uh, to the, the transfer portal. Well, you've got to have some guys that Bill Beatonbow has a chance to really just um, get development into. So, um, those six names or even the five with, you know, you left out off of lava. There's not a Sooner fan that, that looks at that and doesn't, you know, put a smile on their face because uh, I believe that uh, you are of the mindset that uh, Fasusi is a guy that, I mean, if, if you all, if it was a one and done like the NBA, I think he's a guy who could go to the NFL after just a little bit of a college experience. And you have even made comment that you think he could go straight out of high school LeBron James style. So um, I do want to see Fasusi in a Sooner jersey for three years, though. So uh, let, let, let's do that, especially in the SEC to where, uh, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't just play through a really, really bad ankle for the entire year and be quality that you're wanting to put out there. Yeah, and I want to also preface this. I There's still a world where Oklahoma gets – Two five stars that are not currently committed. And I say that because Foj will be a five star. Andrew Babalola is certainly on the table. But as I was talking about with you guys last night, I think the probability that you land two five stars in this class is like us talking about landing three five star defensive linemen last cycle. It's extremely hard to be able to do that. Someone's going to outbid you on somebody at that point. Yeah. Um, PG, before you say that, one of the big reasons why is Oklahoma has a lot of irons in the fire with Babaloa, Afalava, Rogers, Fasusi, Haywood. So they can't go to one of these guys and be like, you're our guy, which I think that Texas is doing that with Fasusi. And Alabama is doing that with Haywood at this point. Like, you're our guy. They've already got guys in the fold, but you're, you're our last all everything. Whereas Oklahoma – I mean, they've got a lot of cards on the table still that they can pick from. So I think that has something to do with it too. But at the same time, you start hearing some of these rumors of 
Um, guys like Rogers and Fasusi and Hutton having conversations about, you know, one of them needs to learn how to play a different position and stuff like that, because there's only so many tackle spots on the field. Correct. So there, and there is a relationship play. and there is a relationship being built there. So uh, I think that there is, you, you hear that quite often. Um, I'll, I'll choose to believe it on this route, but, uh, again, I, I you know, I, I've leaned on you with Fasusi. Um, I have deferred to everything that you've had conversations with him on. And so, Michael, if you're watching this, um, you know, I told you I was going to let PG keep keep that relationship going strong. And uh, so, but, you know, we'd love to see you, buddy. Oh, we'd love to see Michael Fasusi here. And I do want to say for the people that kind of wonder about Sean Hutton and why he's a key piece. Um, and, and, and I would say it's almost like a Dominic Williams situation, right? Where they offered Joshua Williams because not because it helped but because he's talented enough to play for you. And why not just go ahead and make that move right there? Especially if it's going to help you out in the current situation. Sean Hutton is a really good player. And he is deserving of a scholarship spot. I think him waiting right now is probably the right decision. Like, it's there's going to be an opportunity for him. And uh, there might just be an opportunity for him at the University of Oklahoma. And if he can get in here and come compete, Sean Hutton might be a guy that might surprise somebody here in a couple of years. Uh, I, I th- Again, I think the big outlier right now is Andrew Babalola. Does he commit before Fasusi? And if it's Oklahoma, can Oklahoma still land Fasusi at that point? I think that's the big question. So moving on looking at linebacker so i thought we weren't going to take any more linebackers in this class after marcus james i really didn't i thought we were done there wasn't just there wasn't anybody that stuck out and it didn't seem like after OU moved on from christian thatcher there was just a clear-cut person that you could point to and say that's it Jaden o'neill just committed to the university of oklahoma marky hitcher he's announcing on july 1st his decision which I love it. Gerald McCoy replied to him on Twitter and just pointed out this just so happens that your commitment date is going to be on the day Oklahoma enters into the SEC. Are you really going to commit to the ponies? So (laughs) what's your thoughts here, Coop? Because I'm kind of in agreement with Gerald McCoy. Seems like the writing's on the wall. Oklahoma's probably going to be the pick for Marky Hennichor. Yeah, and you know... (laughs) I will say this is if you're watching, if you're watching this and we brought up Christian Thatcher, Christian Thatcher was a guy that, you know, he was on campus about a year ago at this point and he was absolutely, um, you know, he was smitten with Oklahoma. Well, um, you know, when we moved on from Ted Roof and brought in Zach Alley, you know, some of those plans changed. Uh, Marcus James is an absolute stud and I'm excited to see him because I think he is a, he's a solid guy that's, you're going to kind of forget about. And I think that all of a sudden you're going to be like, Oh crap. I I forgot that we, we took that commitment. Um, So Marcus James is is entering a loaded position. Well, then you have Melendez and Hinecor come to campus, you know, just a few days ago and they both had a blast. Now Melendez since then has, you know, committed to Miami and he's a thousand percent in, you see him, doing, I I find it funny that everybody's doing the I'm all in and poker chip stuff all of a sudden, but uh, that's neither here nor there. (laughs) So um, I I think that you have Yannikor, he comes in, um, he is a guy who is not as big as Elijah Melendez was. Uh, I think Yannikor is 6'2", 210, 215. Um, He does play some linebacker um, and he does play linebacker and running back. So right Right then and there, you see a guy, you know, you saw Canick was an all everything when he was in college and pumped the brakes. You know, I'm hearing that Canick's having an absolute, uh, you know, just mental leaps and bounds this summer. So, uh, you know, I, I'm looking towards that. But, um, but Inacor has already been playing linebacker. He has been playing it. And I think that he is going to be, you know, in, in that pathway of Kobe McKenzie. He is, he's going to have that. He has the frame to put on more weight. And I think he has the frame to put on good weight. Um, so you'll, you'll see uh, a little bit of a muscle hamster out of him, you know, once he gets in with Schmitty. But again, you don't have to have Marcus James or Hanekor show up ready to play linebacker because of what we have out in front of him. And so Inacor is the, is the linebacker that I think that we take. Now, if Oklahoma finds somebody between here and uh, December, and or you know Oklahoma goes on a, a nice run, and some other teams have issues. 
I think names do come back into play, but right now I think we just lay into uh, we just lay into Hinnacore and Marcus James, and that's how we round out the class. Now it's interesting too because there's another linebacker that we really don't talk about that Oklahoma is in for, and he was on campus for an official visit, and that's Christian Jones. And Oklahoma did a pretty good job there. I would be interested. I'm not saying Christian Jones is going to be in this class because I think it's Marky Hinnacore. But I'm still curious to see what happens in this Christian Jones race. I know he likes the sole mission that Brenton Venables has been able to lay out for him. Um, he likes he, he thinks it gives them an edge with culture, mind, body, and spirit. Um, so Christian Jones is an interesting prospect. And if he somehow ended up in this class over Marky Hinnacore, I would not be shocked. And I also would not be upset either because I think Christian Jones out of Omaha, Nebraska is a phenomenal prospect. Definitely. But we got to shift to safety now. And oh. this is an interesting, this I think is another interesting area of discussion. Before we get into that PG, you and I both forgot somebody uh, with, with Smith Robo. Um, oh, no, 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 I no. Think, I, I talked about Smith you, Robo. You put him on there. Okay, there we go. There we go. Uh, yeah, yeah, further up, further in. Here we go. <laughs> yes, I put him in there. No, so we have to talk about an interesting area on the team, and that's going to be safety. And if you all yeah. remember early in the recruiting cycle, the name Jonah Williams was being thrown around a lot. Five-star safety, Galveston, Texas. A lot of people thought it was going to commit to Oklahoma in March, and then everything fell off track. Now he's got the predictions in favor of AM. Baseball kid. AM's playing in the national championship in baseball, unfortunately. Man, I would love to have this guy, but I think you got to turn your attention to Marion Robinson. Four star safety out of Little Rock, Arkansas. It's Little Rock, Arkansas, right? Little Rock. Yeah, I mean, here, I bet. I've got I, right I think it's Little Rock, too. I think. Regardless, really good friends with Marcus Wimberly. Uh, I know Marcus has been putting a lot of work into uh, Marion Robinson. For Oklahoma, you really haven't been battle Oregon right there and Arkansas. For some reason, uh, kids are still drawn to Arkansas, even though the unknown of Sam Pittman's future. Well, I, I say unknown of Sam Pittman's future. I think we all know Sam Pittman's going to get fired. It felt that like at one point this year they tried to fire him, and it just didn't yeah. work out. But, uh, yeah, no, it seems like kids are still drawn there. So, Marion Robinson, I think, has got to be the favorite pick to be in this class. But you also had one on campus last week in Satona Stewart Jr. Now, don't really know a whole lot there. Very quiet kid when I've been able to reach out to him. Only gotten a couple words out of him. But I think Marion Robinson's got to be the favorite. So, Coop, what you thinking here for safety? Yeah, and, and it is Little Rock. Um, but, yeah, the the there, there was a world to where uh, – <laughs> where, you're looking at Jenna Williams and going like, oh, there's a, there's, there's a world where he plays with Peyton Bowen, uh, you know, not too long ago, but I do think that guy like Kyler Murray is a surefire first round draft pick in baseball. And so, um, you know, he may never show up on campus. Um, Bobby Witt. Jr. Yeah. Um, Omarion Robinson and Marcus Wimberly. It, these are two kids that if, if that's your safety takes, uh, I mean, I'll put those two guys up against between character and talents. Um, you know, you and I were talking in the green room that, you know, Wimberly is a guy that, uh, you know, it, it's not often that like a 17, 18 year old kid, like motivates me to be a better person. Yeah. And, um, and he is one of those guys. Uh, and now also you, you bring in Marion uh, Robinson and, you know, he's right at that six foot 185 area. Um, more of that free safety build. But I mean, both of these guys like to tell you about their capability of hitting when you, they're out on the field and they speak with their pads. And so those are two, two guys that you should love if you're, if you're, if you're an Oklahoma fan. Um, we've made the comment um, on, on our lives that between Brandon Hall and Jay Valai, these guys are going out and they are basically – picking out guys early in the cycle. They're, they're cultivating that relationship. They're, they're working with them. So a Marion Robinson is one that, um, you know, it, it's pretty fun that you might be able to take the, uh, you know, two of the top three players out of the state of Arkansas and just bring them over here. And you know what, the, the, the allure of Arkansas 
is an, you know, Pittman is a guy that you want to follow. He's like that Ed or Orgeron type of guy. You, you will run through a wall for that guy. But at the same time, just because you're a great man and a great motivator and a great leader doesn't mean that you're necessarily a great football coach. Yeah. And, uh, if you don't land a Marion Robinson, which is a possibility, Oregon, Arkansas, they're going to give you a run for your money. You ask yourself, what do you do at safety? I think you probably just roll with Marcus Wimberly because you've got a really good safety room, a young safety yeah. room. And you could probably get one or two guys out of the transfer portal if you absolutely needed to. Yeah, guys that could come in and make a difference for you right away. So I don't think addressing the safety position is as big as like addressing offensive line this year, which is crazy to say that we need to address the offensive line because I feel like we got a really good room. It's just really young and you want to continue to stack that talent yeah. there, uh, especially yeah. if you potentially put not one, but two guys into the NFL draft this year, potentially in the first round. So shift in gears one more time, or at least I feel like this will be the last time Cortez mills. So I feel like he's got to be your last wide receiver pick. And that's crazy to say because Emma Jones has a stacked wide receiver room as it is. But a Cortez Mills, is, I don't think, is a talent that you guys can pass on. No. Um, and, and you look at anywhere between four and potentially six receivers not here next year. And so the guarantees are you're going to see um, – you're, you're, you're going to see uh, J.J. Hester is – he's no more eligibility. He's going to be out. Um, Jalil Farouk, he's going to be gone. Um, Deion Burks, he's going to be gone also. And then what does the year look like for Nick Anderson or um, Jaden Gibson? If those two guys have great years or if Andrew Anthony says, hey, listen, I'm a little up there in age, and even though that he's coming off the, uh, the knee this year, if he gets any opportunity to play at all – I think that, you know, there's a chance where you lose six. So that's why you bring in a lot more because I don't think that you can run into your second year in the SEC without some kind of, you know, you're going to have to have a lot of numbers to find who's going to be the, the next man up. And you've got great guys in, in the fold already. So with um, Cortez Mills, I believe that you made a comment on another show that uh, he looks like OBJ. And OBJ has changed the way that receivers attack the ball, young receivers attack the ball. But this guy just wins 50-50 balls. Um, you know, he had a highlight out that he just put of himself, not in huddle, but of him just, you know, at the OU camp. I think it was at the OU camp. And he is just absolute a, a human L2 button. Like he has not only the capabilities to go up and high point the ball up over almost anybody, but he also has moves and he can shake people a la C.D. Lamb against Texas whenever he played Texas. So, uh, yeah, you bring in Cortez Mills. That's somebody that, um, that, that, that you bring in now. What happens if another name comes up in the in, in the fold? I think that you know guys like Andrew Marsh, guys like you know that we've kind of gone away from at this point. I think that Emmett Jones has put. I mean, he was pretty fair during this whole you know this whole process with all these wide receivers, and so we just got Emmanuel Choice on board. He's another big body, and Cortez Mills kind of falls in that um, that Marcus Harris and that Elijah Thomas you know, fold to where it's not the small, fast guy burner and it's not the big guy uh, like a manual choice. He, he's somewhere in that middle, but he does have juice. He does have that ability to high point. And he, I think that he's just an absolute freaking nature as a wide receiver as it is. The only one that I potentially watch for if we get Cortez Mills and maybe Caleb Cunningham wants to jump on board is a guy like Grayson Harris. And Grayson Harris is a really good talent. He's four-star prospect, number 361 kid in the country, according to the 247 composite. Um, does a little bit of track and field, plays baseball. So I believe he'll be a slot wide receiver at his size. Um, A&M needs wide receivers. And again, A&M's baseball program, they've got a lot of momentum. Like that would be the only guy that I would worry about at that point because A&M could start playing that card of, hey, well, OU's recruiting over you. They got Marcus Harris at your – so, like, I think right now that commitment sticks. That's just the only one I would watch for if you got Cortez Mills uh, and maybe Caleb Cunningham wanted to jump on board is A&M could really try to make a push there. Uh, don't think it's likely at this point, but anything can happen. So, Oklahoma's 2025 class, it's going to be special. If we look at the guys that we just all talked about, Oklahoma, Landon, 
It gives Oklahoma a 279.51 composite score. So as that currently sits, that would put Oklahoma at number two. Now, I know Alabama's waiting on three five stars to commit to them. So you can imagine Ohio State and Alabama will fight for number one. Georgia will probably be at number three because they've got two five stars that need to commit. Outside of those top three, it's open. Four and five. I think Oklahoma, depending on what they land, they could go for four. But I think an ideal expectation for Oklahoma is a top five class being number five. If you land Andrew Babalola, which I think that's the X factor here. I mean, at that point, we're talking maybe a top three class at 286. So 2025, it's the year for Bill Biedenboe. If he lands just Michael Fasusi, Sean Hutton, Ryan Foje, Owen Hollenbeck, Lamont Rogers, I think he's undoubtedly your recruiter of the year. I don't think there's anybody in the country that does a better job than him. It would it would be it would be to the ire of a lot of Oklahoma fans, and we've mentioned it too. That um, you know, then I think that people have to go find a new coach to to uh, to to you know gnash their teeth at. And, you know, with their pitchforks and torches. So um, this just continues to be not only just great talent coming in, but you have just great absolute individuals. You know, we were talking about before we came on that, um, you know, we've had a really, really quiet offseason the past couple of years until a couple of uh, oopses here the past couple of weeks. But um, the character and how that, you know, who is being recruited in, it's been, you know, talked at a nauseum that, you know, Brent Venables and, and crew are going after guys who are, you know, team captains and who are high quality individuals um, with great leadership skills. So uh, if you're a Sooner fan, you've got talent and great people coming. And um, you know, this is the programs in a great space right now. Programs in a great space. All right, Coop. Appreciate you jumping on, talking through this 2025 class. We're going to have to, Oh, man, we're going to have to dissect 2026 here pretty soon because we've already got three commits in that class. And uh, I don't want to be in another position where I go to dissect that class and they already got eight commits by the end of the year. So we got to look at that one here pretty soon. But uh, where can everybody find your content at? Because I know you got a great co-host with you. Oh, yeah. We had to check out Jay and I at Unfair Sports for the Sooner or Later podcast. Um, you can check us out on the Bird app or the X app or whatever we want to call it now. Um, and then also on YouTube. And, um, you know, we, we've got some cool thing, things coming up here, PG. I'm going to be doing a, a little fireside chat with uh, some of the parents of our players. And so uh, be looking for some of that content because I think a lot of us want to know what that process looks like. Um, you know, from guys, from people who are, are now outside of that, um, you know, hey, what is it, what is it like to, you know, want the best for your child, but then also allow them the freedom to, you know, go in and do some of their own decision making and, you know, how, how much, you know, I, I have two children of my own and um, it's, it's hard because, uh, you know, that's, that's something you want to direct them in the right way. But at this point, this is their, uh, you know, it's their time. So check us out on unfair sports. Uh, we, we, uh, are uh, always putting out contents and um, Jay is, is, is like way up here and then, you know, like right here. So um, Jay is, 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 is the King Supreme. Yeah. And uh, Reggie Powers, listen, he'll tell you what it's like to be a recruits dad on the recruiting trail telling you after the first visit, you got to learn to not load up your plate. <laughs> Me- measure, measure your, yeah. <laughs> so I thought that was a funny one today. All right. Well, if you guys have made it this far and you haven't already, make sure you guys hit that like, hit that subscribe button. And as always, join the discussion, jump in the comments below.